Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday in September. Whether you are joining us online or here in person, it is a joy to be here worshiping with you today. I've got a few announcements as we begin. Uh, the first is a couple of items on our calendar. A reminder that session does uh, meet today following worship. We'll meet in this upstairs classroom here. Feel free to go down to fellowship for a few minutes, grab a cup of coffee, and then we'll uh, reconvene around 1050. Next week on September 25th, we do have adult Sunday school listed. Um, however, for this week only, we do have a conflict um, because we are meeting to discuss Christmas. Uh, those are the new ornaments for our Christmas tree coming up in December. If Christmas are something that's interest, of interest to you, if you would like to be part of that group uh, that works on putting the new ornaments and decorations together for our Christmas tree, uh, please join us for that meeting. It'll be at 11 o'clock following worship next Sunday. And then we'll resume this adult Sunday school yeah, it, two weeks from that, every second and fourth Sunday, just not this fourth Sunday. A um, couple of other items. Uh, if you have not yet filled it out and are interested in doing so, a uh, congregation is picking the hymns for the month of October. On the back side of the calendar is uh, an insert. You can tear that off if you would like to hear your favorite songs in worship. We'll be compiling those, so please uh, take a moment to fill that out if you would like to be included. We are also doing an in-house picture directory. That is, we are not hiring a company to come in from the outside, um, but we will have members of the congregation taking pictures following worship in on three Sundays in October, the 16th, 23rd, and 30th. I hope that you'll be able to attend worship one or more of those Sundays. We'll get your picture taken um, with or without your family, whatever your preference is, and we will include it in our directory. Uh, we hope to have all information for the new directory um, put together. Um, we hope to have it into the office by the end of October if you have any corrections or changes you'd like to make. And then hope to have everything published um, around Thanksgiving time so that you'll have a new and updated directory in time for Christmas cards if that is something that's of uh, importance to you. Also, we um, have continued to work on replacing our lighting within the church. Um, the biggest portion of the project has now begun, um, and that largest portion is replacing the panel lights in the ceilings in the offices and then eventually downstairs. If you want to see some of the new lighting in action, um, the offices, uh, the secretary's office, my office, and the adult Sunday school classroom those have been replaced if you wanna um, check out and see what they look like. It's so subtle you'll hardly notice, but it's a great improvement and uh, it really is a capital improvement in our building, uh, replacing um, some light fixtures that we can no longer get parts for if things do break down. Um, and so we are, this is, a, this is a great thing. And a huge thank you to uh, Dan Agnew and Lee Hickey for doing the work of getting those in. I know we've got uh, another announcement for the congregation. Jeanette, what do you have for us? Thank you. Um, a happy birthday in Fellowship Hall following worship for Barb Brewer. And then we have a, a moment for mission as a continued part of our session's uh, plans and outreach for our environmental concerns for this year. Lee. Starting with the band. Like Jessica said, we've as a congregation, we've been talking about the 
job we were given when we were placed upon earth. And that was to take work and care for the land that we live on. But are we really good stewards of the earth? I mean, are we really good stewards of the earth? Are we aware of all the things that we could be doing? So I'm going to talk a little bit about plastics. Plastics are everywhere, if you think about it. They're in your refrigerator. They're on the road you drove over here on. Um, they're in the Arctic. They're even on the, the slopes of Mount Everest, for God's sake. Um, I don't want to bore you with facts and figures, but granted, the impacts might not affect me. They might not affect you. But they surely will affect people like Cole and Sophie and Grace. Um, the hard kids. Even Jackson. Are we doing everything that we could do to limit the impact we have on the earth? Just a, a few little things. It's not so much the plastics that are on the earth today, but it's the production of those things. Do you know what they're made up of? Fossil fuels. To produce plastic, you have to burn things like coal, gas, um, things like that. So, as a result, it affects our environment via, you know, the greenhouse gas effect. But, but what can we do? I mean, granted, we're just, we're just a small portion of the problem. There is actually a counter online that you can look at that, that reflects the amount of plastic bags that have been prepared or, or produced in any given day, week, year, month. When I looked this morning, today alone, there have already been over 5 billion plastic bags produced. 5 billion. I did a little bit of, of, of easy math and looking at some of the formulas. The amount of plastic that, that we use on a daily basis equates to 12 gallons of gas. Look at the price of gas. All these small things add up, but what can we do? When you go to the store, do you want a bag? Sure, do you want that double bag? Why not? Do you really need to do that? Do you know that these things are reusable? You can wash them and use them multiple times. If you don't want to reuse them, you know that there's a place in Great Falls where you can recycle them. Target will take your, your used plastic bag. Are you aware of all the symbols that are appearing on the plastic that you use? There are basically seven kinds of plastics. There's a really easily found chart that you can find that tells where that plastic came from, what it's made up of, it can, if it can be reused or it can be recycled. Really simple thing to do. Do you know that there are plastics that are specifically made to be recycled? Easily found. And because a lot of people don't know about it, a lot of times you can find them on sale or on clearance. Plastic bottles. Every plastic bottle has a symbol on it that equates to one of the kinds of plastics that it is whether it can be recycled, and what, what it could be used for. Believe it or not, this shirt is made from recycled plastic bottles. There are a lot of things we can do if you just educate yourself and think about it a little bit. You don't want to use a water bottle, use a reusable one. Every little thing helps. Granted, like I said, we may not have an impact, but in the long term, we have to do something. We need to start someplace. How many of you got the, the reusable sunrise bag? Do you have it in your car? I don't. It's a real easy thing to do. And a lot of places will even pay you, if you use one of these things, they'll take five dollars or five cents off your bill, or ten cents off your bill. Whether you use one of these, or if you bring your own. So educate yourself and think about it just a little bit. On my last prop. Big changes start small. Start with the little things. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Lee. Lee's been researching plastic now for a couple of months, and he found um, a, a really interesting statistic 
about how much plastic we eat. I wish you would have shared that. Do you remember that statistic? No, but the one I do remember that I didn't bring up by the year 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than there are fish. Huh. Uh, pretty, pretty interesting stuff. You know, a um, hundred years ago, we didn't have plastic. And it's amazing how much our world has changed for the better because of plastic. Um, as, you know, um, in the medical field and technology and safety and all of those amazing things. It's not that plastic's bad, it's just um, conscientious use of it. Thank you for that reminder. With that, let us uh, joyfully and prayerfully enter into our time of worship with this morning's prelude. As God calls us into community together, let us call ourselves to worship. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all God's benefits. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and of great kindness. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so is God's mercy great upon those who fear God. Let us join together our voices in our first hymn, number two, Come Thou Almighty King.
we need to forgive. Trusting in the promise of grace that us can transcend sin. O oh God, when trials beset us, it is natural to fear. Called to be courageous, we find our faith lacking. When asked to take risks, we confess our complacency. By ignoring injustice, we hope that it will subside. You have shown us how you are a God to be trusted. Leading your people, you have stayed by their side. Even Christ overcame his enemies as he hung on the cross. Forgive our reluctance to believe in your guidance. Grant us the wisdom to seek refuge in you. Amen. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. sent me to you, and they ask me, 
What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Let's end with the word. I'd like to invite our children up for a time of conversation. Good morning. How are you? Oh, hi. We got a dinosaur and a cat this morning. What's new? Can I turn the microphone? What's new? Oh, oh. What's new? Nothing? Nothing new? What'd you think of all that rain this week? <laughs> Don't remember. Oh yeah, you guys have a smoke warning for a lot of these weeks, huh? Have you stay in from inside? Yeah. Maybe you can see it. I like it. So last week we talked about baby Moses. Remember that? We learned the story about baby Moses and sang a song about baby Moses. Remember when he was floating in a basket in the river Nile? And then the princess was swimming in the, in the river, and she saw the baby in the basket. And she took the baby home, and he grew up in the palace. And we ended that song last week saying that Moses was going to save the Israelite people. So that's what we're talking about today. Do any of you know how we save the people? I think you know this story, just don't remember it. The first thing he did is he got himself a big stick. <laughs> They're laughing because they know it's true. He calls it a staff. And he went and he talked to the Pharaoh and tried to get the Pharaoh to let the people go. The Pharaoh didn't want to let the people go. But eventually, Moses took the people and they ran away from Pharaoh. I mean, as fast as a group of 15,000 people can run. And then they got to the sea, to the ocean. There were too many people. Too many people to swim across the sea. And a lot of them were little families. Moms and dads and children. And so they were stuck. They had the sea on one side, and they had Pharaoh's army on the other side. So what did he do? He used a stick. God said, Moses, hold up your staff, and I am going to part the water. <laughs> and you're going to walk through it. Mm -hmm. I knew you knew this story. You're going to walk through it on dry ground and take my people to the other side. And that's how we see the people. Do you remember it now? We learned a song about it? Would that be okay? We learned another song this week? No! <laughs> I love songs too. And this song is kind of a fun one. Okay, you're going to have to maybe spin around. We only have one reader in the group this morning, so it might be tricky. You'll have to listen closely. I'm trying. Oh, 
know, that's as loud as it wants to go. Well, I don't know what happened to the sound there, but it's a pretty fun song, huh? So does it tell the story? Give me the recap. What, what, did, what did Moses do? Do you remember what he did first? He went and asked the Pharaoh to let the people go. And Pharaoh did it, so Moses took the people. They went to the sea. <laughs> and Moses, with God's help, parted the water. And they went through on dry land. And God saved the people that way. That is today's story. So now we have two stories of Moses. The first was the baby in the basket. The second is Moses taking his people to freedom. And next week we're going to take one more week about Moses and we're going to learn about the Ten Commandments. So thank you for joining me today. I hope that you enjoyed the song, even if it was a little quiet. And I will see you during coffee time and then Sunday school. Okay, head back to your seats. And while they're getting settled, I would invite you to uh, stand as you are able. We'll join together in singing hymn number 52.
be seated. The story of the crossing of the Red Sea. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and camp in the front of Feriotha, between Migdol and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon. You shall camp opposite to it by the sea. Pharaoh will say to the Israelites, They are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has closed in on them. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, so that I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that all the people had fled, the minds of Pharaoh and his officials were changed toward the people. And they said, What have we done, letting Israel leave our service? So he had the chariot made, his chariot made ready, and he took his army with him. He took six hundred of the best chariots, and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the Israelites, who were going out boldly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, his chariot drivers, and his army. They overtook them camped by the sea at Ferioth, in front of Baal Zephon. And Pharaoh drew near, and the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites called out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is it not the very thing we were told to you in Egypt? Let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. Then the Lord of Moses said, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. But you lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. Then I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And so I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots and his chariot drivers. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord." when I have gained glory for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his chariot drivers. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night, one did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of the Pharaoh's horses and chariots and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, 
Let us free from, flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back up over the Egyptians upon their chariots and their chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers and the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, and not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. So ends the reading of the word. So today we have the story of the Exodus. The story of the Israelite people leaving Egypt. The story here, which is a, a, a long uh, saga-like narrative, comes after the Abrahamic stories, that is, the, after the stories of Abraham and his initial descendants and a few generations that follow. And in terms of importance, the Exodus story cannot be understated in terms of just how important and integral it is to the Judeo-Christian faith. In my opinion, there are probably only two other narratives in scripture that are more important than the Exodus story. That would be the story of creation itself and the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. All the stories about the prophets all the stories about the kings, all of the epistles that were written, all of the work of the early Christians that are recorded, all of those fall aside and pale in comparison to the importance of the Exodus story. It is one of the most integral pieces of Judeo-Christian faith. So today we are going to look at it in three parts. And if you were to, to, to think about the sermon, this would be sort of a, a, a meta-narrative, right? We're looking at the large picture. There are scholars who spend their entire lives studying just the Exodus story. The texts and sermons on it are, are too vast to number because it is such, an, such a key part of faith. So today, we are just going to look very briefly at, at the three parts of the story that really kind of stand out here. The first is the story of the plagues. The second is the crossing of the sea. And the third is what happens on the other side, which, which we um, didn't hear in the scripture, but leads to what happens next. So last week, we talked about the story of baby Moses, Moses in his infancy and childhood. Talked about how the Israelite people have been enslaved in Egypt and have been enslaved now for several hundred years. Um, the story of the Exodus sits in history at about 1300 BCE. And uh, there just aren't a lot of texts and narratives that are old enough to give us a great picture of the history. The best ways that they're able to date these, um, uh, where the Exodus narrative is situated, is by, um, uh, through the understanding of Egyptian history and what pharaohs reigned at what time and for how long. That's basically the best way they've been able to date the Exodus story. So we're situated at approximately 1300 BCE. And there's an assumption that the Israelite people have been enslaved there for at least 300 years. So 
So we're talking about several generations now of Israelite people who have been living in exile in Egypt, eventually, uh, uh, initially thought that many of them may have come into Egypt as free people. They weren't brought in as slaves. They were a free people who came in, um, even uh, perhaps as part of the Joseph narrative. Remember how Joseph saves his brothers from famine? And eventually, one or more of the pharaohs in Egypt begin enslaving the Israelite people until we reach a point where the entire population is now enslaved and have been living enslaved for generations. They don't remember themselves freedom or what it looks like. And neither did their parents or their grandparents or their grandparents' grandparents. And the current Pharaoh, the one that they are under at this moment, has become a tyrant to the people and is treat, treating them very harshly. Not only is, uh, do we hear the story about Moses and uh, the killing of infants that's happening at this time, but we also hear about this continual and continued oppressive labor that the Pharaoh keeps pushing upon the Israelite people, making their jobs harder and as a people making them more expendable. So Moses, who God has in particular been preparing for this moment, is called by God to free the Israelite people. And Moses, who understands Egypt and Egyptian rule and Egyptian pharaohs, goes before the king of Egypt, the pharaoh, and asks and or demands, depending on how you're reading the text, that the people be freed. And the pharaoh doesn't like that idea very much. So that leads us into the second portion, right? We have this um, back and forth narrative that starts to happen between Moses and the Pharaoh and the plagues. If you, uh, if you were of, of the science-minded variety and have ever wondered, were the plagues real? Uh, there was a great Time Magazine article that came out a couple years ago in 2019 that actually talked about sort of the science of the plagues and whether or not it could really happen. Um, if you've got 10 minutes to kill on a Sunday afternoon, it's worth reading. Um, it was, the article was originally written in 2019, was updated um, just a couple months ago in 2022, um, regardless. So Moses confronts the Pharaoh, demands the release of the Israelites, the Pharaoh doesn't have any desire to do that because why would you let your slave labor leave just because somebody asked you to? That's ridiculous. But Moses comes armed with God, right? With, with the power of God and brings on a plague. He says, Pharaoh, if you don't do this, something terrible is going to happen. And that terrible thing is going to be that the water of the Nile is going to turn to blood. And in order to get the plague to stop, the Pharaoh says, oh, okay, take the people, make it stop, and you can have the people. And as soon as the plague ends, Pharaoh changes his mind. And they do it again and again. We go through 10 plagues in all. We have the turning of the water to blood, we have frogs, lice, flies, livestock pestilence, boils, hail, locusts, which I think people on the eastern part of Montana this year can really uh, relate to, darkness, and it finally ends in the killing of the firstborn children. And each time, the Pharaoh agrees to free the Israelites once the plague is lifted 
And each time he goes back on his word as soon as the plague ends. And finally, Moses is able to take the people and go. But they haven't gone very far before Pharaoh changes his mind. Or as the scripture says, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And that leads us to the crossing of the sea. When it comes to the crossing of the sea, it is a strong image that so many of us, I think, carry from childhood. Can you, as you sit there, can you picture the books that you read that have the pictures of them? Or can you even see maybe the picture that your Sunday school teacher held up every year that showed Moses uh, with his staff and his long clothing leading the people through that narrow tunnel. Everybody's walking single file behind him. It's, it's, a, it's an image that we are uh, almost have seared in our brains, this idea of God through Moses leading the people to freedom. Parting the water, the people follow. But it's also really the stuff of nightmares. We have this lovely childhood, almost cartoonish image of God leading the people through the water. But it is a thin and precarious line. If we are to really, if, if you really sit and, and, and think about the implications of it, it, it gives me chills, this idea of walking literally through walls of water that are held only by faith that could come crashing down at any moment and not only kill me, but everyone I love. This precarious place that they've been put in with Pharaoh's army behind them, the sea in front of them, and a narrow path through. If they'd stayed, there were two options, right? And interestingly, I think scripture is kind of vague on this. We're not sure if Pharaoh is so angry he wants to kill them for leaving, or if he just wants to drag them back to slavery. But neither are good options. They have nowhere to go, and then God sends an angel to stand between them and the army, to keep the army far enough back that the people are able to walk to safety. And that's a part of this too, right? We can see the vulnerability of the Israelite people who have literally left with nothing but unleavened bread, right? They ran out with just the supplies they were able to take with them. They are the poorest of the people of the country as slaves. They have left in a hurry. They don't have the resources of the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh is pursuing them with chariots and horses and people who are trained soldiers. God brings an angel to stand between them. The Israelites follow Moses through this water. And once the Israelite people cross the sea, the Lord commands Moses to again stretch out his hand back over the sea with his staff, the water returns and drowns the Egyptian army. And that too, I think, is the stuff of nightmares. Because we understand that it was the Pharaoh who didn't want the people to leave. I don't think it's right for us to believe 
that the thousands of people who were in Pharaoh's army wanted to be there. The Pharaoh, through his own greed, through his evil, drowns his own people. It is a victory for the Israelites that they are safe on the other side, that they are freed from oppression. But there is a great cost in human life that comes with it. The warriors of the Pharaoh have been caught up in the Pharaoh's greed and the Pharaoh's fear of the Israelite people. And thousands die as a result of it. So now we're on the other side. And Moses and the Israelites sing a song of triumph to the Lord, praising God for God's salvation and for God's strength and for God's might and for overcoming the Pharaoh's army. And then we get this um, beautiful uh, sort of full circle image of Moses' sister Miriam the one without whom we wouldn't have the story, right? Because it's Miriam who places the baby near the Pharaoh's daughter. Miriam, who is the one who said to Pharaoh's daughter, I happen to have a wet nurse for you. The one who brings Moses' own mother to nurture him. Miriam, the sister of Moses, who has assisted Moses as a baby who has accompanied him now out of Egypt, sings her own song. And she leads the women in singing and dancing and music and gives celebration for the Israelites upon their successful journey out of Egypt. She praises God for God's glorious triumph over Pharaoh's army. A very simplified answer to what the Egypt, Egyptian pharaoh story is, the story of Moses leading his people out of slavery. The very short answer to what is the story about is that we call upon God and God saves us. But there are a lot of deeper layers to this Exodus story. It would take us a lifetime to explore them, and people have, like I said, dedicated their entire lives to it. But this story includes an examination of slavery and injustice and oppression. It includes a separation between the acts of a leader or government and the acts of the population that are called or forced to serve a leader. It brings questions like, did those who pursued Moses really have a choice? And where it leaves us is in the wilderness. Quite literally, we now have a wandering people, a people who are now watching and waiting for what God will do next. It is absolutely a redemption story, a story of how God can bring us out of the depths of human experience. But it's also a story about how it can take a long time after redemption to move toward fruition, because God's plan is just now starting. After all of that, God's people are just beginning a new journey. One that would be 40 years in the wilderness and dependence on God and God's grace. And a, a lot, a whole lot of watching 
and waiting to see what God will do next. Thanks be to God for God's grace. Amen. God longs for us to bring everything that we are, everything that we have, to this relationship. God loves us that much. May the offerings we bring this day to think of our reciprocal desire.
releases the captives. Hear our prayer of thanksgiving for the freedom you offer. You delivered the Israelites from the hands of the Pharaoh. You parted the seas for them to pass through. You made them aware of your presence in the pillar of fire. They knew you were near as clouds moved in the sky. Give you thanks for us, our mighty witness, which testifies to your trust in your people in spite of their doubt. We own our very existence to your pardon, which lets us dwell in your favor. We acknowledge your safe keeping, which is the bedrock of faith. Amen. If, let us join together now in our next hymn, number 476. As we come into our time of intercession, what joys and concerns do you bring with you today? Kimber. Prayers for Woody and his family upon the death of his brother David earlier this week. Thank you. Ben. Oh, no. 
Thank you, Ben. Um, Barb Brewer will not be able to make it for her birthday celebration today, um, or fell earlier this morning. Um, so please keep Barb in your prayers. Um, and Ben can, uh, if you'd like to find out more about that, Ben can fill you in later on that. Um, other joys and concerns that you bring today? Hi, hey, Jeanette. Mm-hmm. Um, continued prayers for uh, Forsyth's daughter's uh, nephew, daughter-in-law's nephew, yes, Gavin. Um, Gavin uh, has been in the hospital now for several weeks after being assaulted um, and severely injured. We'll continue to keep Gavin in our prayers. Yeah. Uh, thank you. For Rowena's uh, neighbor, Alexis, who is currently um, having difficulty in uh, with cancer. Thank you. Richard? Thank you. Prayers of Thanksgiving that we are able to gather together in the presence of the Lord. Thank you for that. Um, request for prayers for those who fight silent battles that we are unaware of, especially those when it comes to um, mental health and mental wellness. But uh, we know that there are many among us who have uh, silent battles of all kinds that, that they struggle with. Yes. Um, Prayers of celebration for the um, life of Queen Elizabeth uh, and her long-standing reign and all that she did with it. Seeing no others, would you please join with me in our response of prayer of intercession? Help us, O God of our salvation. Deliver us for the glory of your name. You are one, O God, and you have given us one mediator in Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is in his name that we offer our prayers of thanksgiving, intercession, and supplication for the poor and needy in our land and in every land, those who are trampled on by the rich, bought and sold for profit, for families torn apart by violence lands laid waste by destruction, and cities ruined by war. For all those who are beset by illness or grief, whose hearts are sick, whose joy is gone. We pray these things through Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all, and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us join now in our closing hymn, Number 69, Here I Am, Lord.
us listen for God's call as we go out away from this place. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.